these, this is our study team and our disclosures, and we did receive external funding from the Bristol Myers Squibb Virology Research Fellows Award. So a little background on DNA resistance testing. You're all familiar with the standard RNA genotype resistance testing. Um, and, and the, GNA, the RNA genotype testing requires the presence of circulating virus, um, at least 500 copies per mil. Um, there's been a clinical movement recently towards switching to newer, better tolerated, and simpler antiretroviral regimens. Um, however, uh, switch studies such as switch Merck, especially switch Merck, have highlighted the need for evaluating the presence of pre-existing resistance mutations prior to switching antiretrovirals. Um, but since we only can perform the RNA genotype test um, on patients with circulating virus, switching these patients who are already suppressed um, has been difficult. And if you remember, the switch Merck study was evaluating a switch from a protease inhibitor-based regimen to raltegravir um, integrase inhibitor-based regimen. And um, they actually found that uh, the group that switched to the raltegravir-based regimen had a higher rate of virologic failure compared to the group that stayed on the PI-based regimen. And it was found that, this, that these patients had, pre, had M184, the nucleoside resistance that had not been um, caught prior to the switch. Um, so uh, the DNA genotype resistance testing can be done on patients who have HIV RNA suppression. So this could provide an avenue to evaluate for pre-existing resistance mutations in these patients. However, uh, clinical outcomes data um, in these patients who have been managed after the test has been performed or have not been described. So the GenoSure archive test from Monogram is, was the, is the commercially available test that's available now, and it became available in 2014, in October of 2014. And the test requires a whole blood sample, and um, uh, from the peripheral blood mononuclear cells, uh, the cellular DNA is extracted and amplified, and uh, by next generation sequencing, uh, evaluates the polymerase region and um, provides an interpretation of resistance mutations, much like the RNA genotypes. So um, after this test became available at the Owen Clinic, there was a pretty good uptake. Uh, there were a lot of tests ordered, and um, it got us wondering, well, does the test actually work? And so there have been uh, several studies, retrospective studies, looking at um, comparing resistance mutations identified by DNA resistance testing to mutations found in RNA resistance testing that had been previously done on the same patients. And um, some comparisons have shown concordance as high as 88 to 92 percent uh, between the DNA and the prior historical RNA test. Um, this one listed in particularly um, may actually be have difference in the methodology because the samples that they were looking at were PBM, stored PBMC samples with a very high proportion of PBMCs versus the actual clinically available assay, which you take four, C, four milliliters of whole blood. So the sample is much more diluted out. Um, and then other studies. Um, have, found, have actually found that DNA resistance testing may actually detect fewer resistance mutations than prior RNA tests. So our main question after reviewing all of this was, do, does the test actually Im, impact clinical outcomes? And so does the HIV resistance test improve the proportion of persons with suppressed viral RNA after the tests were available to the provider? So our objectives were to determine the HIV RNA suppression rates in patients for whom an archive test was ordered at the Owen Clinic at a time point of four or more months after the test. And we also wanted to determine the rationale for ordering the test in the clinic. Um, and our study was approved by the UCSD IRB. We collected a list of all patients for whom HIV DNA resistance testing was ordered 
at the Owen Clinic and assessed the first 95 for whom complete data was available. And the providers were also surveyed on their rationale for ordering the test in each individual patient. So 91% were male. The mean age was 51. Mean duration of antiretroviral therapy was 14 years. The median number of antiretroviral drug that the patients had been previously exposed to were eight, including those in the current regimen. And at the time of the DNA resistance test, 47% uh, were on protease inhibitor-based regimens, 33% were on more complicated regimens defined as three or more antiretroviral classes, 6% were on NNRTI-based regimens, 6% on integrase inhibitor-based regimens, and 7% were actually not on antiretrovirals at the time of test. And just of note, this group that was not on antiretrovirals that were viremic, um, it's unlikely that, that the test was actually indicated in those patients because the test is specifically indicated for those with low-level viremia or those that are um, already suppressed that are planning a switch in antiretrovirals. So these are the provider survey results. Um, when asked the rationale for ordering the DNA genotype, 78% uh, uh, noted that they ordered the test in anticipation of antiretroviral switch, 15% due to low-level viremia, and 12% said other. And they were given the option in all of these to choose more than one answer. Um, of those who were anticipating an antiretroviral regimen switch, 61% anticipated a switch from a protease inhibitor to an integrase inhibitor-based regimen, and 8 from an NNRTI, 8% from an NNRTI to an integrase inhibitor-based regimen, and 32% said other switch not listed. And then when asked their reasons for, for wanting to switch their patient's regimen, 1% uh, said to get rid of food requirements with their current regimen, 7% said for cost reduction, 8% in anticipation of hepatitis C treatment and drug-drug interactions there, 19% uh, due to current medication interactions, 46% for toxicity reduction, and 82% said to simplify the regimen. So this is kind of showing what happened to the patients. Of the 95, 13 were lost to follow-up, uh, so they did not have a viral load within a year. Um, three of the tests actually failed to produce a result, and um, that left 79. 58 of those were virologically suppressed on antiretroviral therapy at the time of test. 16 were on antiretrovirals but not virologically suppressed, and that was defined as a viral load less than or equal to 50. And five were not on antiretrovirals, so that's the group where the test was likely not indicated. Of the 58 that were virologically suppressed at the time of test, 21, 28 switched to antiretroviral therapy and 30 did not. Of the 16 who were not suppressed but were on antiretroviral therapy, nine switched and seven did not. And all of the five who were not on antiretrovirals at the time of test started antiretrovirals. This is looking at the virologic outcome broken down by each of those groups. So of the 58 who were virologically suppressed um, at the time of testing, 96% sustained viral suppression four or more months after testing. Uh, meaning that they maintained a viral load less than or equal to 50. 93% um, of those 28 who switched and 100% of the ones that did not change antiretrovirals. And just of note, these two who um, had a viral load greater than 50 four more months after, they both had viral loads less than 100. And um, so it's questionable whether that was of clinical significance. And um, just looking at each individual, they, um, they, had a, they both had viral loads previously that had varied um, between detectable and undetectable. So there's some question of um, compliance. And then of the 16 who were on antiretrovirals but had viral loads greater than 50 at the time of test, 69% um, achieved viral suppression four or more months after the test. Um, of the nine who switched, seven um, 
seven achieved viral suppression, and of those who did not cha change regimens, four. And just of note, the five who started antiretrovirals who were not on antiretrovirals at the time of testing, all of those obviously had detectable viral loads at baseline, and four of the five achieved viral suppression after starting antiretrovirals. So in conclusion, um, plasma HIV RNA was suppressed in 90% of the HIV-infected patients four or more months after the results of the HIV DNA resistance test became available to the clinician. And prior to testing, 73% of those were virally suppressed. The reasons for ordering the test were varied, but most commonly in anticipation of antiretroviral switch in order to simplify a regimen. And obviously, a larger sample with more prolonged follow-up is needed to confirm the value of this test in the clinical practice. So um, we are expanding our study population by completing data collection on the first 300 patients with HIV DNA resistance testing at the clinic. And we plan to analyze the concordance between the, their prior HIV RNA resistance test mutations and those found in the DNA resistance test. We also will compare outcomes um, in our UCSD clinic to historical study population from SwitchMerc. And we hope to um, have a cost-effectiveness analysis as well. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. That was great, Helen. Time for questions. Riley? A couple of things. I noticed that in the population where the viral load was greater than 50, it looked just based on the numbers that a higher percentage maintained an undetectable viral load in the population that switched compared to those that didn't switch. Mm -hmm. um, is that, did you guys look into why that was the case? Not a, no, um, although I will say that in the, in the population who switched just as the ones that switched and the ones that were suppressed at baseline, those two um, that switched in the bottom graph, uh, they also had low viral loads, less than 100. And they had viral loads that started a little bit lower as well. The ones in the arm that did not switch were higher. And I, and I, I can only assume that it might have had to do with compliance, why they didn't want to switch, or possibly they found something on there. And then my other question is, are you going through and actually looking if the switch versus no switch was clinically appropriate? So say, example, the doctor just hasn't gotten around to seeing that patient yet in clinic and is planning on switching but hasn't yet, um, and or whether or not it just got missed and they should have switched them, or, you know, those kinds of things. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we are going to look at the specific mutations that were found um, and, you know, try to determine whether it was an appropriate switch based on that, um, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, <clears throat> Alan McCutcheon, do you think it would be uh, wise and, and ethical to do a more uh, randomized clinical trial approach to this question? And uh, how much more observational data would you need before you go in that direction? Right, yeah. So I mean, we're obviously going to finish out the study, and I think it would be an interesting idea. I think the one thing about doing a, you know, a prospective clinical trial is that a lot of this is based on the provider making a decision and and if if the provider knows that you're that you're intervening you know then it might not they might make certain decisions that they wouldn't normally make um, so I'm not sure you know how practical it is to do a Absolutely. right <laughs> yeah About 20 years ago, Richard Halbrick and I tried to do one of these uh, clinical strategies studies, and we found a problem with the, um, apparently, with the providers favoring one arm over right. the other. And yet, that has to be part of the process, so it's a tricky proposition. Yeah. But uh, if you decide to do that, I'd like to show you that, how to avoid that particular okay. problem. Yeah, I, <clears throat> it's a good question, Alan. Um, it obviously takes a much bigger investment to do a prospective study. And one of our main goals in this project was to understand. I, I was somewhat astounded how many tests we ordered in a relatively short period of time. And one of the things I wanted to understand was 
who were the patients for whom this not inexpensive test was being sent and did that add value to their management? And I think if you do a randomized prospective clinical trial, you test the assay itself and secondarily maybe how people use the information from the assay. But we kind of wanted to get ahead of that in the sense of why are these patients getting the test ordered? How often is that not really aligned with the, what the test is thought to do? And did that influence either negatively, positively, or have no impact on outcomes? Um, we have over 300 patients in our registry, and we believe we're about to get the thumbs up from the IRB to look at that broader sample size. And I think that will allow us to make some more definitive conclusions. But I think your idea is a good one. We would need external investment. We'd be reluctant. The company won't invest in it because the perception among providers is, oh, yeah, this is great. And so they get a lot of tests ordered, and, and therefore they make money. And the only outcome that would alter that is if the test turned out to be awful and people stopped ordering it. So I'm not sure who would support it. And I think when we get a larger sample size, hopefully our understanding will be sufficient to inform you know, clinicians how best to use it.